So now we're going to give you uh, insight that you're, you're never going to be able to unknow. You're going to notice this now all the time. Um, and that is that the, the facial expressions um, are split between the top half of the face and the bottom half of the face. With the bottom half of the face, we're extremely expressive. All of us can do move one part of our mouth back and not the other one. So I can move the, my right or my left. But if you ask me to, to lift one eyebrow, you know, okay, it doesn't really happen. Um, and, 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 and I have, in fact, asked many people to lift one eyebrow. Um, I have a survey of over 4,000 people. And it turns out that about 15% of people can lift one eyebrow or the other. And a smaller percentage can, can lift one at a time, lift both sides um, separately. So uh, there is a, and, and this difference, the, the ability to move the bottom half of the face so easily and so universally compared to the very few that can move the top half of the face. And, and many people can kind of move it. They screw up their face in all sorts of ways in, in order to accomplish it. Um, uh, and, and then there are some that can do it really well. And I'll just show you. This is one of my medical students, Laura Christensen. And she can, she can move uh, each of her eyebrows in isolation. Really, really talented. Um, if you, most of the people that can do this, even if they can only do one, she can do two, but regardless of whether they can do one or two, they'll usually have a story as to when they figured out how to do it. Okay? How did they learn how to do it? They, they decided that you know, their piano teacher did it and it looked really cool, so they decided they were going to sit there and look in the mirror for, for a couple of days until they could figure out how to do it. Now, I think some people try to learn how to do it and can't. I, I, I don't believe that I can do this. But uh, for some people, it's an, it's, an, it's an available movement, but it takes training. What's the difference? What is, what's underlying this uh, universally easy control of the bottom half of the face and this universally difficult, belabored control of the top half? And the, and the uh, fact is that the facial nucleus has two sets of, of motor neuron pools. It has the motor neuron pools that innervate the bottom half of the face, and it has the motor neuron pools that innervate the top half of the face. These two different pools get two different innervations. The input, the cortical bulbar tract, only goes to this pool that innervates the bottom half of the face. So here is motor cortex, it innervates the muscles that go to the bottom half of the face. Here is a different area, a um, uh, uh, supplementary motor area, and there's an area in uh, anterior cingulate that also go, that innervates the mo motor neurons that innervate the top half of the face bilaterally. So you can imagine a lesion here is going to be is going to be uh, basically unaffected is not going to have an effect because there's still the innervation from the other side. The other reason that this uh, is typically asymptomatic is because um, most of the movements that we make with the top half of our face, which are not as as fine as the ones that we make with our bottom half, are symmetric. They're bilaterally symmetric. So we do this. Um, whereas we are capable very easily, very automatically, of making lateralized movements with the bottom half of our face. To do that, we use the cortical bulbar tract. So this organization has some very important consequences, and you have to learn this. So you are going to be asked to, to, to differentiate between a Bell's palsy a cortical bulbar tract lesion and, and some other lesion. So really what, you, what I want you to understand is what's different between a cortical bulbar tract lesion and a Bell's palsy. The cortical bulbar tract lesion is called a supranuclear facial palsy. Okay, so it means, that means that the input above the facial nucleus is supranuclear. 
That's where the lesion is. The cortical bulbar tract is supranuclear. All right. So what happens if you lose this tract, if there's a lesion here or anywhere along this path, is that you cannot move the face contralateral to the, to the motor cortex uh, uh, that, that's affected. So you can't not lose the, move the lower half of the face. If you lose, instead, you lose this innervation to the top half of the face, no, there's no symptoms. Nothing happens. All right. So let's take an example. If we can zoom in, let's zoom in on this side. On this side, what you see is that the person can move their face on the right and not on the left. Now is this, you get two choices, 50% chance of being right. One choice is this person has Bell's palsy and the other per choice is this person has supernuclear, supernuclear palsy. Which one is it? Think about it. How are you gonna tell the difference? Think about that, okay? You thought about it? So. With a Bell's palsy, the whole half of the face is going to be out of commission. You can't move the top half or the bottom half. With a supranuclear palsy, you can't move the bottom half. And what you see here is that there are wrinkles. They stop dead midline. He's not moving the top half of his face. So he has a Bell's palsy. He does not have supranuclear palsy, facial palsy. So if he has... Bell's palsy, then what other symptoms are you looking for? You're looking for, for dry eyes and dry mouth. You're looking possibly for hyperacusis. You're looking for uh, potential pain in the ear. And you're looking for, uh, you can test whether, the, whether he's sensitive to a taste put onto the left front of the tongue. All right, so that's Bell's palsy. None of those things are going to accompany, none of those other things are going to accompany a uh, supranuclear palsy. So we, you won't have the ear problem. You won't have the taste issue sign. You will not have the uh, dry eyes and dry mouth. Now, will you have the hyperacusis? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. And the answer is you will not because the hyperacusis, remember, is a reflex. It doesn't depend, you can't make yourself pull back your, your stapes. You can't make yourself engage your stapedius. It's automatically engaged. So the cortical bulbar tract is ending on muscles of facial expression, but not on the, it's ending on motor neurons that innervate the muscles of facial expression, but not on the motor neurons that innervate the stapedius. Okay, so Let's just go through this, and I belabor this because you will get a question that will make sure that you understand the difference between a central lesion and a Bell's palsy, all right? You have to understand the control of facial expressions, not just to pass the boards, which you do have to, you do have to, there will be a question about this on the boards, but, but also Bell's palsy is, is really common, and, and, and having a stroke a central stroke is a very different beast than having Bell's palsy. You want to know this. You want to know this because you're going to have family and friends that encounter this. You're going to have, you might have patients, um, okay? So you really want to remember this. So for a Bell's palsy, the, the seventh uh, cranial nerve seven is cut. That's going to uh, make you lose the ability to move the face on the entire half of the face. With a supranuclear lesion, uh, only the contralateral, contralateral to the, to the source of the cortical bulbar tract involved, uh, only the bottom half contralateral to that lesion, uh, the origin of that lesion is going to be affected. Okay. And just to, uh, I'll leave you with this. You can study this on your own. Uh, I, I, all I can say is learn this. Learn it. Okay, I'm going to test you on it just so that when you get to the boards, you're going to ace it. Okay, <laughs> next, we're going to look at the difference um, between a lesion of a motor neuron and a lesion in a motor control center, in a descending tract from a motor control center. Mm -hmm.